I'm Bonnie Gabowitz, and this is Ward Talk. On Ward Talk, we discuss issues and solutions for the city of Ann Arbor. And today we have from Ward One, Jeff Hayner. Welcome, Jeff. No, thank you for having me. And Jeff, this is the month of May. It's also coming to the end of your term. Uh, so this is a good time for us to talk about what presently going on with Ann Arbor, with Ward 1, and also taking a look back at your service uh, for, as council member. So let's start with Ward 1. What's happening with Ward 1? Well, uh, you know, Ward 1 had, um, after the 2020 census, we had a redistricting. And so we lost some of our southern and south um, eastern parts of the ward, including uh, uh, the area around uh, South U, the uh, West Quad, South Quad, and so on. So we shifted from losing some of that undergraduate student, which traditionally has low participation because of our um, partisan primaries in August. And so we've sort of lost some of that non-participatory areas and gained what I hope will be uh, greater participatory areas uh, in the, um, you know, especially the near downtown area, Cary Town area. Um, a lot of the high rises are in Ward 1 now and also a lot right up the street from me here on Pontiac Trail where we have massive development going in. So, so that's gonna change the demographics a little bit. So this will already take place uh, at the next election, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, they read the, and they also have changed the nomenclature of the um, various precincts. And so people need to check their, um, they can go online to the city website, a2gov.org and check the clerk's office and check their assigned precinct numbers, the voting, the, the, the polling places haven't changed, uh, necessarily some have around the fringe, but, um, the numbering of them has. And so that's going to be a little different for folks. And I also anticipate there's going to be, uh, as the trend has been nationwide, much more absentee voting this year. Mm -hmm. And when is the next election coming up? Uh, August. So, so, so yeah. we, they have time. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, the, the absentee ballots will start going out probably the third week of June, I think it is. I have to, I don't know the exact date, but it's usually around then. So it's mm -hmm. really sort of a early primary, you might say, I, mm -hmm. a good deal of its absentee. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, how many years have you been in service now uh, for Wood One? Well, this is my fourth year. I, I was one of the first of the group to have a full four year terms. Um, went from two to four, and um, there was a skip year where they had three year terms. So Ann Ban I served with Ann Bannister for two of her three years, and um, now I have a four year term that's closing in November. Right. So let's talk about uh, uh, I, four years of service, and I'm sure you had a lot of uh, different areas in which you worked individually, such as in committees, uh, as well as on the, the council, as a council member. So let's just talk about some of the things you've accomplished in those four years. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you know, the, fir the first two years were pretty great. We had a nice balance of folks who were, kind of took a holistic look at the, the challenges and the policy issues before us. And we were able to work kind of as a, as a group, as a whole. And we got a lot of things done. Um, top on my list was to try and get the EPA involved in the Gelman, uh, Gelman plume matter. And we were successful in that. And they're in the middle of their um, really second preliminary assessment. So I don't know if you'd really call it a preliminary assessment, but that's what it is called. Um, yeah, gathering data and um, that, you know, I could talk about that forever. Maybe we can come back to it. Um, we got the center of the city rolling, the commons down there on the library lot. Uh, we paid down our pension mandates, and this year it was announced in our budget uh, cycle that we have fully funded our city's pension mandates. Now, I expect that to slide a little because we also have grown our staff over almost 17% over the last decade, um, which is sort of odd to me compared to only a 6% population growth. So City Hall is growing much faster in proportion than the city is. Um, let's see, we uh, we assigned the 10 uh relatively unused city properties, including some parking lots to the Ann Arbor Housing Commission to be developed for social housing, which I think is gonna be a great step forward. We had to catch up on that issue a little bit. Um, we bought Lurie Terrace and have committed it to be an, an affordable senior housing project 
essentially in, in perpetuity. And we also um, really upped the uh, increase in spending on social services around social housing. And we just got a nice report from uh, Jen Hall at the Housing Commission about um, an, a, a actual analysis they did of the increased spending and dedication to that. And it has been proven very successful in keeping people housed and, and moreover transitioning them to a permanent housing so that it frees up spaces in our, in our necessary you know, uh, uh, housing. Um, what else have we done? Well, we, we, right out of the shoot, we did some interesting things. Um, our first meeting, we pre-funded what had yet to be adopted, the A20 Climate Action Plan. Then we went ahead and adopted that plan. We gave a quarter million dollars to get that running. Our first meeting, I, I was looking back at some of my notes. It was interesting. Um, and you know that was nice to, nice to do. We increased some transparency around the, the bidding process, budgeting process. Uh, we got rid of the deer call. Um, we established some community gardens and just all kinds of stuff. It's been really, I, I feel like I've accomplished some of the things I set out to do. Yeah. Some are still in the works, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and as usual, what, as I've been doing this over the years, one thing that's constant is is everything's complicated and takes time, and doesn't necessarily have an expected schedule to be done. So you've yeah. seen that over the four years. Yeah, that's true. And you know, they, they say the ship estate turns slowly, and it certainly is the case. And we we've seen some um, kind of uh, excellent quick responses in some of the decisions we made like our new police chief has been really really excellent in uh, creating a community policing um, expanding the community policing and the relationship between the police and the community and um, has been very open to uh, working with uh, not only with other entities like the county and the university and so on but uh, working with um, groups that are advocating for what they are calling a you know unarmed response or basically a mental health response and so that that's finally getting off the ground well i think we could have had it a few years ago but we kind of reassigned some money um so you know that that's been good to see some places where you know staff changes have made an immediate impact on the well-being of our community uh, you mentioned uh, the gelman plume and i understand there's some new information about what's happening with that so let's give a let's get an update on that. Well, sure. I mean, you know, the EPA has been involved, and immediately they they started in the formal process of involvement or restarted the formal process, including the city now. And uh, one of the things that I was happy to see was they assigned someone to sit in on all the card meetings, the the card group meetings. And so they have been getting the kind of direct feedback from the folks who really kind of know what's going on both in the field and historically. And that's really helped them speed the process. Uh, SIO has gotten more involved and has um, are drilling their own set of exploratory wells, of, of monitoring wells. And the city's going ahead with our monitoring well system. And so um, we're going to confirm what has, I, I, my presumption is that we're going to confirm what's been suspected is that we, the, the plume is traveling, migrating in many different directions. And it, is much further north and, and eastward than we would like it to be. And that's unfortunate, um, but better to know than not know. Um, and as part of our water treatment plant upgrades and redoing, um, we're leaving space in the treatment train to deal with the potential for having to do the advanced oxidation type treatment to remove dioxin if it does end up in Barton Pond. And so, you know, that that's just to see that it's still on people's radar and it's moving forward with our with, along with our partners in the townships, um, that that's been and the federal government, that's been a relief. So, at what point did Sio Township get more involved with working with Ann Arbor? Well, they've always been involved, but when you know, when when we started having these large joint meetings with all the stake community stakeholders, um, that really helped a lot. And as we had the consent judgment came back into the courtroom. Um, they were very involved, along with some, especially a handful of folks at the county, like Sue Shank and some others, who really were advocating for the right solutions for uh, more direct action, more monitoring, and and uh, uh, you know more commitment and to to put the squeeze Gelman. And so um, Gelman has been in a situation where um, they have they have come under pressure. They, they violated other parts of the clean water laws. 
So there's a MS4 type, there's a thing called MS4 permit, which is a, a discharge into the op storm water, uh, which includes streams and, and, and so on. And their discharge from their treatment has been in excess of those uh, MS4 permit limits. And so we've had to say, hey, look, and so we were able to drag them back into court on every single thing we can. And I hate to do it because the court moves slowly, but um, it, it, it moves and, and we got to hold their feet to the fire. They have to, they have to take responsibility for this. So. Right. So this is a topic, of course, we'll continue to watch, watch, but it sounds like you're, you're sounding more positive that uh, we'll see some in movement on this. Yeah. I mean, we just have to, they have to increase their pumping and treating. And they also, I've been advocating for them to start setting aside a larger cash bond because that is not inexpensive equipment that's going to go and have, have to go under a water treatment train at the plant there. And uh, uh, they should be paying for that and they should be prepared to pay for that. So it's one of the things that I am definitely going to, uh, I will continue to stay involved and probably more involved, um, you know, after my service is over on council. Right, right. Well, after our break, uh, we're going to continue talking about what's going on in Ann Arbor. Okay. Okay. This is Bonnie Gabowitz for Ward Talk. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to email us at ctn at a2gov.org. You could also follow us on Twitter at Twitter, Twitter at twitter.com slash ctn in Arbor. You can also follow not only this program, but other CTN programs on YouTube at youtube.com slash CTN in Arbor. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Bonnie Gabowitz. We're back with Ward Talk and Jeff Hayner from Ward One. We're continuing with our discussion about Ann Arbor. And I know one of the big issues that has always been there, but is particularly big issue, is the development of the city, both uh, commercially and uh, with housing and the types of new development that's going on. Uh, so take it away. What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are that we're not we're not approaching this in a way that is going to have the outcome that we would desire. Um, I think we need more of an equitable type of growth in the city. And really, we're pushing for a massive density, massive growth. Um, if you put together some of the documents that sit out there, policy documents, um, you'd see that the idea, the notion is to basically create 80,000 new units of housing in the next seven years. And so good luck with that, you know, and, and good luck thinking that that where, isn't where, going to. Where does that number come from? Well, it comes from the 820 plan and it comes from some associated plans with the um, various transportation plans and so on, where the complaint is that we have 80,000 commuters and we're trying to get them all to come here so that we cut down on their uh, miles traveled. But I think we all know that um, people are gonna live where they wanna live and they, many of those people who commute here, commute here for the uh, good jobs that the university provides and also a service industry type jobs and they can't afford to live in Ann Arbor. And so they're gonna drive from the town, the townships are blowing up, you know, uh, Sio and Pittsfield, uh, Pittsfield, especially out Maple Road and so on towards Saline. It's, it's hundreds and hundreds of acres in the, just the last several months have come under development out there. Right. And so until the buses start running all the way to Saline, I, I doubt we're gonna reduce automobile traffic. But and, if you, yeah, I just want to ask you something uh, in terms of what kind of development goes on, whether it's affordable housing or very, very expensive housing. Isn't it all dictated by, you know, what the parameters are of, of the, you know, how the property is labeled as to what kind of use it can be? Yeah, so so the zoning code is is we have a comprehensive land use plan, which used to be called a master plan. We're trying to change the words around that language around that. 
And uh, that's actually, we budgeted to redo the master plan. And so I think it's very important for folks who want to preserve uh, um, the kind of their input into what's happening here with development in the city. Um, and if they have strong ideas about what the communities should be shaped like in the future to be involved in the upcoming um, uh, comprehensive land use review. Um, we have gone ahead um, really against my wishes and against many resolutions and amendments I've brought to um, already do things to push this notion of density is going to be the solution to our housing problems. For instance, we created the TC1, this supposed transit corridor type zoning. Well, the transit hubs don't exist already. And we've it's a it was a rare and lost opportunity to create with the new zoning designation the type of housing we wanted. In other words, we could say uh, these various parcels in the first instance, it was 68 parcels are zoned a certain way. So they were office or commercial or, or residential or whatever they were. And mostly these were commercial type properties. Um, and we could say, hey, we're trying to encourage residential mixed use, higher density, whatever. And of course that means more profit for the developer if they can build larger and more dense. And so we had an opportunity to say, if you want to seek this new type of zoning, then you, a percentage of your housing has to be priced a certain way. Um, your buildings have to be designed in a way that exceeds the current building codes, let's say net zero type buildings. Um, you have to have increased stormwater management and so on and so on. And so we can incentivize those kinds of things, but instead, every time we make a new zoning category, we just give it away. And the notion is that, uh, the, that these things are more expensive and so people won't develop under that, but really we haven't given them a chance. And if you look at our downtown premiums, there are a dozen properties who have taken advantage of the residential premiums in the last couple of years. And it's mostly the high rises around the Huron area. Um, and also the South U area who have taken advantage of the residential premiums and happily built larger buildings and more housing. And theoretically, some of those prices will be reduced. Um, so if we give people a chance to take advantage of these things, then it, they likely will, but we haven't given them a chance. We've just handed it over to them. And so I think that's a big failure on the part of council. Any building that is built today that we expect to be standing in 2030 should be, according to our A20 plan, carbon neutral, because they're not going to tear them down and make them rebuild with carbon neutral in seven, eight years. And it's much more expensive to retrofit a building than it is to build it properly the first time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm a little radical on this matter. I would have a, it, it, I believe it, that there is a climate emergency and there is a carbon crisis. And I would have a moratorium on new construction until the laws were in place and the zoning was in place to say, you must build this way if you anticipate your building to be standing in 2030. And that's just not happening because we have a very pro-development council. So they just want, they want, we've even had people on councils vote against having a conversation with the university, asking the university to build their own workforce housing to create some, take some of the pressure off the uh, general market housing. And we've had people vote against that saying, no, it, we don't want any housing that's built that doesn't add to our tax coffers. And that's just so backwards to me. Do we want housing or not? You know, I don't care who builds it. So while we're talking about development, uh, do you have any comments on how the denser population in downtown Ann Arbor and Cary County area um, how that's affected traffic and pedestrians and bu local businesses with uh, all the higher density living. Do you feel that the city has really addressed that enough? Well, I, I don't think so. And, and you know, we kind of have a strange relationship with cars. We recognize that they are polluting, um, that people use them. And we say we want to get rid of cars. And in fact, they're moving the Council, the Planning Commission has already moved and Council will move to um, have zero parking requirements in new buildings. In fact, we're going from parking minimums to parking maximums and some of those maximums are zero. And so that's that the assumption is I move into a nice condo in Carytown, I'm not going to have a car, but we know that they do. And so hmm. we'll see if people do want to develop and build housing that, of course, it, I'd, I'd much rather see the money, money spent on um, building uh, housing for people instead of housing for cars. Okay. But if we're complaining about traffic in the downtown area, then 
let's convert all our giant parking structures to housing. And nobody wants to do that. And so we kind of want to have it both ways. We recognize that people are going to drive from the outlying areas to enjoy our downtown, especially on the weekends, shopping nights, evenings and things. And they need a place to park. And until we do park and ride or a reliable shuttle or the, the whole kind of mindset of our society changes, uh, you know, we shouldn't have thousands and thousands of units of parking in our downtown if we don't want cars coming downtown. So it's yeah. it's one of those things. It's sort of a chicken egg thing, but um, it's more than that. It's sort of a, a failure to uh, really kind of, in my mind, to take a look at what's going on. And as far as the pedestrian concerns go around density, I, I started having, I have a, uh, a dash cam in my truck now, and I could, I could put a best of reel on CTN that would make your head spin. I'm sure anybody who's driven through Ann Arbor has seen it. Um, just folks just run across in front of lights and the whole thing. And, and um, you know, it's a miracle that uh, um, we've remained steady with our pedestrian fatalities in my mind. Uh, mm -hmm. We definitely have not, progress toward vision zero right now so right so uh, where is your position on allowing the restaurants and businesses to take over some of the downtown streets during the warm weather which yeah. already started well we you know I, we've kind of enjoyed that it's been good for the businesses i don't i don't have a problem with closing streets like that i've supported that i i didn't support um i was the lone vote against these um uh, social districts where you can get a takeout cup and walk around with a drink. Um, the police don't love that. I don't love it. And the, the truth is um, I, I would, I would suggest on a busy weekend night, we could, we could write 50 DUI tickets coming out of this downtown area, you know? And so I don't want to encourage public intoxication like that. Um, we've had tragedy in our own family from uh, we've had, from drunk driving accidents and um i just I, i'm just not down with that social district idea but it passed and the businesses like it um you know it gives them an opportunity to come back from covid where they had very little customers and now they're able to have more outdoor seating and things and so, i know those are two different things but um they're kind of in the same area and so you know it's been good for the business and so we rode our bikes down to town um this it was actually my anniversary uh this is my 25th wedding anniversary this oh. this week and so this past weekend, we rode our bikes downtown and went out to eat and kind of wandered around, saw what it was like. And, you know, it's nice to see people out in the streets and the streets are for everyone. And if if we can do that without clogging traffic, then uh, I think it's I think it's, a, you know, it's a nice community builder. Right. Now, uh, before we end, something just came up in the news. I just wanted to clarify that uh, some citizens are have created a lawsuit against the city dealing with charges for stormwater. If you could just articulate what the argument is or what the complaint is. Sure, yeah, this is sort of like round two. We, we had a suit earlier that was uh, all of our uh, water, stormwater and sanitary sewer fees. And this is sort of a narrow approach on that where they're just talking about the stormwater fees and the, the um, folks who are bringing the suit are the claim is that uh, it's not a fee that's commensurate with the cost of providing the service but a tax and their logic behind that is that essentially that we charge more for the stormwater part of their uh, of our, all our bills than is actually goes to paying for the stormwater service needs and it it's it's kind of hinging on is it a tax or a fee because we do indeed save up so we do charge more than it actually costs to provide those stormwater services and maintenance to that stormwater system and we also shunt off we we brought in under the stormwater budget lines and those those funds um like forestry is now paid for with stormwater management fees and so the question is, what is, is that a direct impact? Does the savings for future investment in our stormwater, um, is it, should it be allowed under the law? And so that's kind of where they're at. And I, I won't opine on the right or wrongness of this, but I will say that we are on track to in the next two years since I started on council, uh, it's a 20, 
a year before I started on council, we started raising our rates, as you are probably well aware. First, we reshuffled our rates so that um, they we recreated the tiers. So uh, multifamily paid less, essentially, and uh, single family paid more, and um, commercial paid less, and wholesale, and so on. And, and now we've we've gone up, and we've gone up six to seven percent on all categories of the stormwater and water fees, and it's set to double. So it will have doubled over eight years. So in 2016, 17, whatever, it's going to be doubled by the end of a year and a half from now. And that's really something because it's hard to believe that it costs twice as much to provide those services. And I think we should be looking for cost savings as well as increases in fees, but we never seem to do that. I have yet to vote for a increase in a city fee for service. Well, that's really a big ouch. It really <laughs> is. And especially if you're a fixed income. And so right. we're driving, you know, we're so you get back to that housing issue. If all we're building is market rate, which is essentially luxury type housing, and all we can do at the housing commission and is folks who are 60 or below AMI, there's a huge amount of us who are trapped in the middle. We don't have housing available to us. People are paying 300,000 cash for 800 square foot house. And who can compete with that? What young family can compete with that? And we bought our house in 96 and I'm sure it's worth four or five times what we paid then you know and that you know it doesn't help you till you die and it's sold or whatever so i don't yeah I, i'm very unhappy with our with our approach to housing which is basically to let the market say what's up and we know what happens then yeah so jeff in the minute we have left uh if you want to just sum up you know your thoughts and feelings about having been on the council and your experience, uh, sure. tell us what you have to say. Well, you know, I mean, it, it it was worth it to do it. And I feel like I was able to help people. A lot of the helping people you don't see at the meetings, it's not around policy or votes or politics. It's one-on-one -on -one relationships, trying to direct them to the right place in city hall, get them some help when they, and to that end, I'm gonna be moving to um, create, a, uh, to further fill out our, um, our rules around, uh, I wanna create an office of the ombuds person at the city because people don't know how, the only way to deal with the city sometimes, you're at wit's end, you end up suing them and we can't, you can't afford to sue city hall. So I'm, I'm gonna bring a resolution to create an office of the ombuds person. And I think that will really help smooth out the relationship people have with the city. Now, my first two years are pretty good. Second two years were not so great. Um, we basically have right now a group of folks who are my way or the highway at City Hall. And when I'm on the street and I talk to people, they are unhappy with that. They're unhappy with big money ruling our local politics. They're unhappy with what they see as sort of, I don't, I don't want to say corruption, but I will say there's some crookedness going on. And we, I've, I have never been in a more hostile kind of group or committee type environment than I have been in this last since 2020. And I don't know what to say about that, except, you know, everybody that I know and respect is trying to do their best for the people in our community. So I know, you know, I really want to take a second to say thank you to CTN for keeping this stuff in front of everybody, because it's an important archive that you're doing. And uh, people really need to see what's going on at City Hall. But I'm not, I'm not with the group of folks who are sort of arrogant in thinking that city government is the end all for our community, that we're just part of the city of Ann Arbor. Really, the city is the people and the businesses and the environment and everything else. And I don't, I don't think that I don't have a big head about my role on city council, um, you know, just trying to do my best. So, okay. and, and I, you know, if it was hopeless, we wouldn't be constantly barraged with propaganda. There's lots of hope. I love our youth who are getting involved in the environmental issues and the tree sitters at Concord Pines and all that. I, okay. The youth is our hope. <laughs> Jeff, we have to close, but I, I want to wish you the best in your future endeavors and thank you for your service and good luck. Well, oh, thank you so much. It's, it's been a real pleasure knowing everybody at CTN and serving our community. This is Bonnie Gabowitz for Ward Talk. I'll see you next month.